Chapter Five, Book Four of Rookwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Paul Curran. Rookwood by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Four, Chapter Five: The Short Pipe. The Payons are capital horsemen and several times we saw them, at a gallop, throw the rein on the horse's neck, take from one pocket a bag of loose tobacco, and with a piece of paper or a leaf of Indian corn, make a cigar, and then take out a flint and steel and light it. Heed's Rough Notes Away they fly past scattered cottages swiftly and skimmingly, like eagles on the wing, along the Enfield Highway. All were well mounted, and the horses, now thoroughly warmed, had got into their paces, and did their work beautifully. None of Coates's party lost ground, but they maintained it at the expense of their steeds, which were streaming like water-carts, while Black Bess had scarcely turned a hair. Turpin, the reader already knows, was a crack rider. He was THE crack rider of England of this time, and perhaps of any time. The craft, a mystery of jockeyship was not so well understood in the eighteenth as it is in the nineteenth century. Men treated their horses differently, and few rode them as well as many ride now, when every youngster takes to the field as naturally as if he had been bred a gaucho. Dick Turpin was a glorious exception to this rule, and anticipated a later age. He rode wonderfully lightly, yet sat in his saddle to perfection, distributing the weight so exquisitely that his horse scarcely felt his pressure. He yielded to every movement made by the animal, and became, as it were, part and parcel of itself. He took care Bess should neither be strained nor wrung. Freely and as lightly as a feather, she was borne along. Beautiful it was to see her in action, to watch her style and temper of covering the ground, and many a first-rate Meltonian might have got a wrinkle from Turpin's seat and conduct. We have before stated that it was not Dick's object to ride away from his pursuers, he could have done that at any moment. He liked the fun of the chase, and would have been sorry to put a period to his own excitement. Confident in his mare, he just kept her at such a speed as should his pursuers completely to it, without in the slightest degree inconveniencing himself. Some judgment of the speed at which they went may be formed, when we state that little better than an hour had elapsed, and nearly twenty miles had been ridden over. Not bad travelling, that, methinks we hear the reader exclaim. "'By the mother that bore me!' said Titus, as they went along in this slapping style. Titus, by the by, rode a big, Roman-nosed, powerful horse, well adapted to his weight, but which required a plentiful exercise both of leg and arm to call forth all his action, and keep his rider alongside his companions. "'By the mother that bore me!' said he, almost thumping the wind out of his flea-bitten Bucephalus with his calves, after the Irish fashion. "'If the fellow isn't lighting his pipe! "'I saw the sparks fly on each side of him, "'and there he goes like a smoky chimney on a frosty morning. "'See, he turns his impudent fizz with the pipe in his mouth. "'Are we to stand that, Mr. Coates?' "'Wait a while, sir. Wait a while,' said Coates. "'We'll smoke him by and by.' "'Peans have been sung in honour of the paeons of the pampas "'by the headlong Sir Francis.' But what the gallant major extols so loudly in the South American horseman, viz., the lighting of a cigar when in mid-career, was accomplished with equal ease by our English highwayman a hundred years ago, nor was it esteemed by him any extravagant feat either. Flint, steel, and tinder were bestowed within Dick's ample pouch. The short pipe was at hand, and within a few seconds there was a stream of vapour exhaling from his lips like the smoke from a steamboat shooting down the river, and tracking his still rapid course through the air. "'I'll let him see what I think of him,' said Dick, coolly, as he turned his head. It was now grey twilight. The mists of coming night were weaving a thin curtain over the rich surrounding landscape. All the sounds and hum of that delicious hour were heard, broken only by the regular clatter of the horse's hooves. Tired of shouting, the chasers now kept on their way in deep silence. Each man held his breath, and plunged his spurs, rowel deep, into his horse, but the animals were already at the top of their speed, and incapable of greater exertion. 
Patterson, who was a hard rider, and perhaps a thought better mounted, kept the lead. The rest followed as they might. Had it been undisturbed by the rush of the cavalcade, the scene would have been still and soothing. Overhead, a cloud of rooks were winging their garrulous flight to the ancestral avenue of an ancient mansion to the right. The bat was on the wing. The distant lowing of a herd of kine saluted the ear at intervals. The blithe whistle of the rustic herdsman, and the merry chime of wagon-bells, rang pleasantly from afar, but these cheerful sounds, which make the still twilight hour delightful, were lost in the tramp of the horsemen, now three abreast. The hind fled to the hedge for shelter, and the wagoner pricked up his ears and fancied he heard the distant rumbling of an earthquake. On rushed the pack, whipping, spurring, tugging for every life. Again they gave voice, in hopes the wagoner might succeed in stopping the fugitive, but Dick was already by his side. "'Hark ye, my tulip!' cried he, taking the pipe from his mouth as they passed. "'Tell my friends behind, they will hear of me at York.' "'What did he say?' asked Patterson, coming up the next moment. "'That you'll find him at York,' replied the wagoner. "'At York!' echoed Coates, in amaze. Turpin was now out of sight, and although our trio flogged with might and main, they could never catch a glimpse of him until, within a short distance of where, they beheld him at the door of a little public house, standing with his bridle in his hand, coolly quaffing a tankard of ale. No sooner were they in sight than Dick vaulted into the saddle and rode off. "'Devil seize you, sir! Why did you not stop him?' exclaimed Patterson as he rode up. "'My horse is dead lame. I can't go any further. "'Do you know what a prize you have missed? "'Do you know who that was?' "'No, sir, I don't,' said the publican. "'But I know he gave me his mare more ale than he took himself, "'and he has given me a guinea instead of a shilling. "'He's a regular good un. "'A good un?' said Patterson. "'It was Turpin, the notorious highwayman. "'We are in pursuit of him. "'Have you any horses? "'Our cattle are all blown. "'You'll find the post down in the town, gentlemen.' "'I'm sorry I can't accommodate you, but I keep snow stabling. "'I wish you a very good evening, sir.' "'Saying which, the publican retreated to his domicile. "'That's a flash crib, I'll be bound,' said Patterson. "'I'll chalk you down, my friend. You may rely upon it. "'Thus far we're done, Mr. Coates. "'But curse me if I give it in. I'll follow him to the world's end first. "'Right, sir. Right,' said the attorney. "'A very proper spirit, Mr. Constable.' "'You would be guilty of neglecting your duty were you to act otherwise. "'You must recollect my father, Mr. Patterson, Christopher, or Kit Coates, "'a name as well known at the Old Bailey as Jonathan Wilde's. "'You recollect him, eh?' "'Perfectly well, sir,' replied the chief constable. "'The greatest thief-taker, though I say it,' continued Coates, "'on record. "'I inherit all his zeal, all his ardour. "'Come along, sir. "'We shall have a fine moon in an hour, bright as day.' "'To the post-house! To the post-house!' Accordingly to the post-house they went, and, with as little delay as circumstances admitted, fresh hacks being procured, accompanied by a postillion, the party again pursued their onward course, encouraged to believe they were still in the right scent. Night had now spread her mantle over the earth. Still, it was not wholly dark. A few stars were twinkling in the deep, cloudless heavens, and a pearly radiance in the eastern horizon heralded the rising of the orb of night. A gentle breeze was stirring. The dews of evening had already fallen, and the air felt bland and dry. It was just the night one would have chosen for a ride, if one ever rode by choice at such an hour, and to Turpin, whose chief excursions were conducted by night, it appeared little less than heavenly. Full of ardour and excitement, determined to execute what he had mentally undertaken, Turpin held on his solitary course. Everything was favourable to his project. The roads were in admirable condition. His mare was in like order. She was inured to hard work, had rested sufficiently in town to recover from the fatigue of her recent journey, and had never been in more perfect training. "'She has now got the wind in her,' said Dick. "'I'll see what she can do. Hark away, lass, hark away.' "'I wish they could see her now,' added he, as he felt her almost fly away with him. Encouraged by her master's voice and hand, Black Bess started forward, at a pace which few horses could have equalled, and scarcely any have sustained so long. Even Dick, 
accustomed as he was to her magnificent action, felt electrified at the speed with which he was borne along. "'Bravo! Bravo!' shouted he. "'Hark away, Bess!' The deep and solemn woods through which they were rushing rang with his shouts, and the sharp rattle of Bess's hoofs, and thus he held his way, while, in the words of the ballad, fled past on right and left how fast, each forest, grove, and bower, on right and left fled past how fast, each city, town, and tower. End of chapter 5, book 4